Hey, John here. So, uh, last time we left off talking about getting the BIOS assembled and connected and linked in with the uh, the BDOS and the CCP. All right, so this is the file. Uh, hasn't changed anything up at top here uh, where we left off last time. All right, quick recap. We use the usual startup. You set up your stack, you know, go to where the code starts, you know, has to be to initialize itself, which is load base. Load base is defined in memory.asm. And this program is designed to be loaded into RAM from the SD card using the the flash uh, bootloader logic, okay? Load base turns out to be hex C000 uh, in the current release of the code. I don't see any real reason to change that. That could stay there probably forever. Uh, but if we run out of memory, we might have to tweak it or something like that, all right? So what does this thing do? Uh, when the flash loader reads this uh, data in, this all the code that's in this file, it, it, it goes at the load base, and because it doesn't know what it has read in, for simplicity's sake, I have it just branch to the address that is load base and let this program deal with it at that point on its own. So what I need it to do is get into the BIOS and boot from there, all right? So the first thing we're going to do is just jump up to BIOS uh, underscore boot, and the rest of this stuff I explained last time, it has to do with making the uh, the, the source code of CPM uh, compatible with and get it located correctly so that we can assemble it from this file here uh, all in with our BIOS in one big wad, all right? Really simple to do it this way, uh, easier than using the usual uh, sysgen process of move CPM and all that other fun stuff. It's pretty straightforward, all right? This is a check to make sure that there is no problems uh, with aligning and, and, and if I messed up the assembly language that gets loaded from here to make sure all the address calculations come out right, okay? So basically this has to start at a specific address, which is the uh, same as the, the, the base address, the beginning the, where the CCP starts, in, in CPM plus uh, this exact number. If it doesn't come out that way, then this will not work, okay? So it's easy enough to just put a macro uh, type thing in here and just check for it and generate an error. If it doesn't work, the assembler will crap out if it gets on that line, all right? So this is what we call the BIOS vector table. Uh, the documentation says very specifically, you must have these instructions at the beginning of your BIOS. So therefore, that's what we put in there. Now, the labels can change, but you have to have this many jump instructions, and they have to have this meaning. The first one has to go to a routine that will boot the system. This one will return the status of the console, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all that information, of course, comes from the uh, CPM alter alteration guide that I showed you where to get yourself a copy of uh, uh, earlier on as well, okay? So this is their uh, documentation for that vector table, and that's what we got in there. Now, last time what we did is we just simply made every single one of these routines simply silently halt the system. I think we printed a message in the boot routine and then halted there. But basically, all we did was assemble this to make sure we could load it and you know start the thing going. All right, so that's where we left off. Let's move forward here and see if we can get this thing to boot up and print something. Okay, uh, in the alteration guide, it talks a little bit about you know kind of how these things work, what they're for. I think uh, most of us kind of already know where we're going. We've actually used computers before, so we know that the console is the thing that is the terminal where you print stuff on the screen and and you can read from the keyboard. The printer is the list device. Punch is a paper tape system. To You can punch holes in paper tape and a reader is a paper tape reader, okay? Uh, we don't have paper tape system. We're gonna, if somebody says, here, punch this, we're gonna just throw it away, okay? If somebody says, hey, I wanna read this from a paper tape, what we're gonna do is we're gonna return a message that says, okay, there's nothing left, which basically we're gonna return an end of file, okay? So we're gonna stub these things in to give a minimum level of satisfaction to CPM so we can actually start up CPM. That's the goal today. Now, they go on in here and say, in order to operate, the BDOS needs only the console status, console in, and console out routines. These other routines might be used by the PIP program. We can see that later on down the road. 
uh, but not the BIOS. It says, further, the list status entry is currently used only by one specific kind of application. Therefore, your initial C BIOS, the customized BIOS that we're going to write, can have empty subroutines for all the other ASCII devices. Now, this is a little bit misleading because it leaves out the fact that <laughs> it also wants all the disk routines. <laughs> so I don't think that these are the only things it needs. What they mean to say, these are the only character-based devices that it needs, all right? Then this is what we're going to do. We're going to get the console to work. Now, it goes on to describe the nature of each of these devices. The console is a character-based device. The printer is the list device. Punch, readers, like I said, okay? Reader, uh, we're going to return a, an, an end of file. Down here it says, you can return an end of file. And then, uh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll satisfy the operating system so the thing won't crash. Anybody ever reads anything? They'll get an empty file. That's what that is. You ever want to print something? Today, I'm going to just silently throw it away and say, okay, I took care of it. Who cares, right? Punch, same thing, okay? Now they get into some advanced features that are optional, ignoring everything optional. I've done this, talked about this before. Let's keep it simple. Then we get to this paragraph right here. This is super important here. So let's let's read that one, okay? What does it say? This guy always, always performs with a sequence of calls to various access subroutines, okay? Uh, which set the disk number, which is like A, drive A, drive B, drive C, and so on, uh, that is going to be used. The track number, the sector number for the drive that has been selected, right? And then uh, the DMA uh, address, the buffer address. We're not going to do direct memory access here. We don't have the hardware for it, but it, logically it's the same thing. So in order to do a, read a sector from a disk or write a sector to a disk, we need to know which disk, <laughs> you know, uh, which track, which sector, and where the buffer is, right? Well, that just makes sense, right? So surprise, uh, that's what we need to deal with. Now, here's the important part. It says, after all these uh, things have been set up, then a call can be made to the read or the write function to perform the actual you know, disk sector data transfer operation. Okay? Okay, no shock there. This is the part we have to really pay attention to right now so we can stub our stuff in and, and, and have it not just fall flat on its face. So says, notice that there's often a single call to select disk, after which, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, uh, you can have a number of read and write operations, all right? So in other words, once they select drive B, and then they're going to set the track and the sector, maybe. And then they'll do, uh, they'll say, hey, I want to read that sector into memory somewhere. Okay, great. If they want to read the very next sector on the disk, what they're saying down here is they're not going to call select disk again. They're probably not even going to call set track again. They might not even change the memory address because it might have just wants uh, to just read another sector and look at the data. And then throw that away, move on to the next sector, and read some more data, okay? So what this all boils down to is that because we can get several calls to the read and write routines that effectively share any previous uh, uh, value that was sent into our BIOS, that's what we're talking about here. These are routines. In the BIOS, you know, there's going to be like a, here, set the disk buffer address. That's going to be this function right here, in fact. Look at these guys. Home means move the disk uh, to uh, the disk head over to track zero. Select disk. That's, uh, you know, what, which, which drive do I want? A, B, C, D, and so on. Set track. Well, if I want to move it to a track that's not Zero, I have, somebody has to tell me what track is going to be. Which sector am I going to use? Which address is the buffer in? Okay, so that paragraph describes what happens in these functions right here. So the takeaway is each one of these routines is basically one line of code. Well, two, if you want to include the return instruction. What are they going to do when they get called and, 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 and somebody says, hey, I want you to select disk A. We're going to store the disk number in a, in, a, in a storage location in our BIOS. 
Somebody says, hey, I want you to set the track for the next I.O. operation. And there'll be a read or a write down here later on. I'm going to use track 27 or whatever it wants, right? What sector number and so on, okay? So it is the job of these routines to store into a local variable inside the BIOS whatever the uh, BDOS wants us to do. So that later on, when we get to reading and writing down here, these are not given any parameters at all, as we're going to see. They do what they need to based on the data that's already been given by all the calls up here. Okay? And look at the rest of these routine. Here's the reader, the punch, the list routine. All three of these are going to just be throw it away, ignore it, get out of here in our stubbed in code. The console in and console out, we already wrote those. These literally are going to be one line of code in our first stubbed in BIOS and might actually re remain that way forever. They, those are done. Console status is almost done. Uh, the only thing wrong with the version that we have now is that we have like, you know, is the receiver ready? Is the transmitter ready? And stuff like that. We have to change the registers and the values to match the way the BDOS wants them, which don't quite match the way uh, the uh, SIO driver uh, works that we wrote. So these might be a whopping four lines of code. Ooh, right? Okay. Now we've already looked at boot, which literally is going to print a message and then start up the OS. But before we start the OS, we need to make sure that these functions over here can work because, as we're going to see, once we start the OS going, it wants to read in the directory of the current disk. So we need to make sure that these things will actually not cause everything to crash when we stub them in. Okay, List status. It already said nothing uses it but one routine. We can stub that in. And then there's this sector translation logic that technically doesn't apply to us at all. So we're going to stub that in by uh, returning. We have to implement this. We have to translate some data. And I'll show you what we do if we're going to just simply stub it in and ignore it. So that means what? We can stub in almost every single thing in here right here right now except for the warm boot code the read code and the write code okay so this video we're going to do every single one of these except for the reading the writing and the and part of the warm boot okay now uh if we look at the, the current version of the retro operating system source code what i've done i've taken the liberty now last time remember we just had every one of these uh, these subroutines all these labels for the boot and all the uh, with the these these jump uh table vector up here every one of these is going to go to some subroutine to do the operation okay that is requested by the by the bdos when it jumps to these various addresses over here where we left off last time is i just put every one of these labels over here on the left and just halted the system now what i've done here i've done two things one I've cut and pasted and, and paraphrased and adjusted minor, you know, some cosmetic changes. This is the Excel text from the alteration guide we were just looking at. And I include the page number in here, which is the page number printed on the page, right? So, for example, if we look at the documentation for the boot routine in the alteration guide on page 17, we will see this. We'll, we'll actually see more than this, but this is to paraphrase it so I can stay focused here, okay? And it, it's really handy so you don't have to keep jumping back and forth all the time. So a uh, quick scan uh, for cosmetic stuff. Each one of these routines is going to have the doc from the alteration guide followed by our stubbed in implementation, which, as you can see, I'm going to just print out a little debug message and go on my merry way for most of these. Now, the boot routine here, we've already seen most of this, okay? The uh, the difference between what I did before and what I'm doing now is uh, we printed out a hello world message, and then what we did is we went to a halt loop down here. So what did I do? I added this. I'm going to zero out what we call the zero page in the uh, machine. Then we're going to do some other initialization, and we're going to fire up the OS, okay? So before I halted right here, now I'm going to actually do some uh, final initializations. We're going to wake up the operating system. 
Now let's take another look at some of the stuff in here that I didn't really copy into our dock yet, all right? Now this goes and gives you a rundown of what each of the devices are like and how they sort of work. Now I copied some of the narrative about what you're supposed to do when you boot and what you're supposed to do when you warm boot, okay? Now if you never used CPM before, the difference is that boot is used once and only once uh, after a cold start. The boot is the code that you have to get into from the boot ROM, your flash boot uh, loader, okay? This is the thing that we branch into from the load base. We go back up here. What's happening there is the uh, boot ROM reads the uh, this executable code into memory starting at C000, which is what that is, branches there. So the first thing this thing is going to do is jump to BIOS boot, and that is what the code is right here. We looked at this before, fire it up, reset all the fun stuff we've been talking about for months, and print out a message going on a merry way. Okay? Now, this is what they're talking about here. Okay? So what are we supposed to do? Print a sign on message. Uh, then it says, if the IO byte is implemented, deal with that. We're, it's optional. We don't do that. And then a various system parameters, which are set by the warm boot entry point, must be initialized. Then when you're done with all that, control must be then transferred to the CCP at this address here. Now, remember, uh, this manual is written as if you have 20 k bytes of RAM. Uh, you know, I showed you the MSI 8080, uh, which is basically the same design as the Altair 8800, where every 4 k bytes of memory costs $250. So this was a big deal to be able to move around the CCP, move around your operating system to all these different addresses and stuff like that. So uh, the dock will always, by default, refer to what would happen if you ran CPM with only 20 k bytes of RAM. All right, so that's where these uh, numbers come from. And the B means if you have more memory, you just add the delta factor. We have 64 k, therefore this would be 3400 in hex plus whatever they they refer to as a bias. B I A S. The you know the delta, the distance between 20 and your 64 k. So this could just move up, right? Anyway, that's why you see these numbers in here that will not match where we're at because we have more RAM. Okay, uh, note that register C must be set to zero to select drive A. So we got to remember to do this, of course. But uh, it, it it refers to this warm boot stuff, and what they're talking about there are these three bullets right here. The boot code has to print messages, start up the CPU, do whatever you need. Because CPM has no idea what a retro board is, where the devices are. It knows nothing of that. Get it set up to go. That's our job. When we're done, go to the entry point of the CCP and put a zero in the C register. Okay? So getting done is our hardware stuff plus these three items here. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to put a jump instruction into memory and byte addresses 0, 1, and 2. And we've just started up. There needs to be an instruction down there that jumps to the warm boot entry point in our BIOS. Location 3 is supposed to have the initial value of the I.O. byte. If we do it, don't care. Locations 5, 6, 7, 3 bytes to hold a jump instruction that goes to the entry point of the BDOS. Now, these values all depend on where the BDOS is. And where your BIOS really is, right? So um, that's why it's up to us to get the right values in there. Otherwise, CPM could do it itself. Now, it might be a good time to mention that I added this doc directory here. So I'm in the CPM directory uh, in the, uh, at the, this is the uh, GitHub repo for the software, okay? There's a new directory in here called doc. And inside there is a PDF, right? You can recompile it if you want. Have fun. But this is the uh, a PDF. It's a, a couple of figures that show how we use the memory and the SD card in here. So let's let's make sure that we don't haven't lost track of the forest for the trees here. All right. So one of the pages says, "Here's your SD card layout." 
Now, remember, I have a 16 gigabyte SD card. All right, let's zoom in on these headings a little bit here, okay? I have a 16 gigabyte SD card, and as we'll see, CPM version 2.2 can only really make use of up to 8 megabyte disk drive uh, uh, disks, okay? Now, because of that, I mean, basically, I have 2,000 times more memory than I need here, okay? And that's just your, you know, $2, $3 variety uh, SD card. So let's look at this really quick. Here's our SD card, and these are not to scale, all right? This unused white portion here is enormous relative to these thingies down here. So let me zoom in on the bottom of the SD card. Now, I've already talked about how the MBR works. That's up to the bootloader to look in the MBR. Why does it do it? It does it to figure out where partition number one is in the SD card. You know, which block number is the first block number of each block being 512 bytes on an SD card, what's the first block number for partition one, and how many blocks comprise partition one? Now, as we've seen before, when you boot up the retro board, the, the flash uh, ROM uh, prints some debugging stuff out, and it starts loading uh, the, the uh, first 16K bytes, the first 20 in hex blocks, that's 32 in decimal, each block being 512 bytes, uh, into memory starting at C000, and that means it'll fill in all the memory from there all the way up to the end of RAM at FFFF, okay? And it dumps out a little debug up here and says, oh, by the way, these are what I believe the partition tables look like, and the first sector, uh, first block, I should say, on the SD card for partition number one starts at hexadecimal 800, and the number of blocks in that partition is this in hex. OK, so uh, if this many blocks in hex times 512 bytes each, you'll find out is 128 megabytes. And I just said we only can deal with eight. Well, look at this little line down here. OK, so here's your uh, 800 in hex through uh, 800 plus the 40,000 in hex blocks that comprise this 128 megs. And I got to stop myself from saying gigs all the time. It's so difficult <laughs> to work with such a small amount of memory. Anyway, so here's our partition one. The very first little teeny bit of partition one is an eight megabyte chunk, which I drew over here on the left side of the page. The eight megabytes is what we call a disk image. So we're going to make CPM think it has a 8 megabyte drive and we're going to and it'll be formatted like this, okay, relatively speaking, and it'll come from a part of partition number 1. And I'm doing this because first of all, creating an 8 megabyte partition on an SD card is almost <laughs> ludicrous. Some partition editors might not even let you make one that small. Uh, but that aside, uh, the main reason for this is in one partition, because it's 128 megs, and each CPM disk image is going to be 8 megabytes in total, this will allow us to have 16 like logical disks all sitting in one partition over here on our SD card. So the very first one of what could be 16 is the only one we care about right now for the foreseeable future. And that first one, the 8 megabytes, is used like this. Uh, we don't need to concern ourselves with the directory and the data blocks yet. Uh, what we do know and may not realize yet, but this uh, first 8 megabyte disk image from that partition starts with 16K. Right, that's what we put in there last time. This is going to be our entire OS. You know, the CCP, the BDOS, the BIOS, all that stuff is in the first twenty in hex or thirty-two in decimal blocks of this partition right here. The rest of it later on, we will be, we'll see that we'll hold the contents of the directory and the data blocks of drive A 
once we get CPM booted and running, okay? So the purpose of this diagram is to make sure that we all kind of remember where everything is and how big they are, okay? Now, once it's loaded into memory, we have another diagram here. This is the memory layout. We've seen all this before. Recap. We have 16 banks of memory, each of which are 32K bytes in size. And so far, with the retro board, all we've ever done is use it in a configuration much like what I've got drawn here. We completely ignore banks 1 through 14, and we'll continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Okay? All we care about is that we have bank 0 in use to hold the contents of the memory from the perspective of the CPU in the bottom 32K of the RAM. Okay, and due to the way the hardware is designed, no matter what happens when the CPU accesses the high uh, 32K bytes of memory, it's always going to simply see the contents of bank 15 over here. Now I put the yellow and green in here to match the yellow and green over here so that you can be reminded when you look at this image here that bank 15 here is what is over here. All right, so in here is where the boot ROM reads in from C000 to FFFF. The green part here, which comes from partition one, uh, the disk one, bottom 16K of that thing, right? So the 16K has all this stuff in there, right? So in the bigger picture, this is how it all kind of fits together. Now, the transient program area, we'll talk about that later. This low page down here is going to come up right now. So the warm boot, those jump instructions are sitting down here in this blue region down there. This is called the zero page, okay? Now, uh, half of the zero page is going to be used for an I.O. buffer. There's 128 bytes reserved for scratch space to do disk uh, sector transfers and stuff like that. And this gets used all the time. The other 128 bytes down here, hex 0 through 80, fills up with, you know, interrupt handler pointers and the uh, the two jump instructions that are right in our face right now that we need to address to get this thing booted up, okay? So, the bootloader has brought the data off the SD card into the green area here, and it is branched right here to C000. There's a jump instruction right here that's at load base that jumps it up into here into the BIOS. And that code that it ends up executing here in the BIOS is what we looked at last time when we printed out something and just shut down right here. So what are we going to do here? First thing we're going to do is we're going to zero out that zero page. And the reason I want to do this is because, remember, when the flash ROM boots up the whole system, it copies all of the code from the flash into memory at address zero. So if we actually look down here in address zero at this time, we will see all the executable code from the flash. And there's really nothing wrong with that. However, it can become incredibly confusing when we look around in the system and we see messages and data from the boot flash that we don't expect to be down there, all right? Because we can lose track of our context. Now, that's one reason to get rid of it. There's another very valid reason to get rid of it. If we forget to do something when we're initializing our system, and it just so happens that there's garbage sitting in the zero page, and it just so happens that that garbage is tolerable, to the BDOS and CPM or even our own BIOS or whatever, okay? And our system works, we'll never realize that while there's garbage down there, it is somehow innocuous or just coincidentally happens to have the right value in it and that our system works, okay? And on the one hand, that's perfectly fine if that literally happens. But it's not so fine if you then later on change the boot flash code and then boot up CPM again, and all of a sudden it stops working. And that sort of thing is really, really, really difficult to debug. So what I want to do is just store all zeros into that zero page right here, right now, so that if we, for example, 
I'm not going to set the I.O. byte. I'm going to leave it alone because we're not going to use it in the BIOS. But what if something else uses that value? Well, at least we know it'll be set to zero. And if that doesn't cause any problems today, it will continue to not cause any problems tomorrow because it will be consistent. Even if it's wrong, it will stay consistent over the course of time, which is an incredibly important thing to take advantage of whenever you can. That's why I zero it out right here. After that, I'm going to just do a hard jump into this Go CPM routine. Why am I going to do that? Because one of the other things we get from the alteration guide here that I haven't really yet to show anybody or talk about are sample uh, implementations of the BIOS. They actually give you the source code to an actual BIOS, and then they give you an, another uh, like a template, a generic one for a uh, custom BIOS. So let's have a look see down there here. All right, we can jump around a little bit, and then hopefully we get off this this manual here. So I'm going to wander around a little bit. I forget what page number this thing is at. Come on, Mr. PDF browser. Here we go. Uh, skeletal gets this, but this is the routine that we're get, we don't need because we use um, the DD uh, command on a Raspberry Pi to read and write data from our SD card. We don't need that routine. Here it is. Here's the skeleton. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So this is not the source code of a real BIOS. This is a skeletal customized one. All right. Now, if we look in here, we'll see some things that are not mentioned in the documentation, all right? Now, whenever there's a, you know, documentation says do A, B, C, and then they give you a sample code that does A, B, C, and D, and maybe E in addition to those things, it might be a good idea to just do those extra ones anyway, just in case they're important. And that's what we're going to see here, all right? So bar bear with me while we jump around a little bit. This only uh, really is a problem while we're getting this thing started. Once it's going, we, we're on our own, and then things are all downhill from there. Um, in terms of <laughs> easy of <laughs> riding your bike downhill, not downhill, uh, it will all be a failure <laughs> downhill. That's, a, that's another kind of downhill. All right, so uh, what do we got going on here? Um, uh, they define some equates that we don't have to do because we have the source code. They define this thing here equal to the CCP entry address plus 806 in hex. Where did that come from? It came from the fact that the manual told you to use that address. <laughs> All right, we'll rummage through and we can find that uh, uh, up above later. Uh, it, it, that's part of the warm boot uh, documentation above. We'll go back there in a minute. Then down here, they define the BIOS as CCP plus this. This is supposed to be where our own code is. You remember that number there matches my little macro check up here. Okay. So what do these labels really mean? Well, this thing here says the CCP shall start at this address. This equate here says the, the BDOS shall start at that address. The BIOS Better start at this address, and so on. Now they have the current disk equate to four. They have the current disk number stored in memory, as we'll see, at address four. And yet there's no real mention of it in the warm boot logic. So it suggests that, I don't know, do we need to set this and save it or not? We'll actually see this used in their warm boot code without any real documentation as to why. So that's one of the things that's screwy. And then they make use of the I.O. byte, which we already know is at address 3. We saw that a minute ago. So this is the same, same sort of thing we do. We org to where the BIOS starts. And now this is the part of their code for the warm start. We're not going to do that today. We're going to run out of time well before then. So we're going to skip over that and just do all the rest of these. We'll come back to warm boot and some other stuff later on. Uh, okay, so there's the jump vector table just like ours. 
We have labels over here and they don't. So what? Okay. Uh, this is stuff that we're going to talk about later on that has to do with defining the parameters so that the BDOS understands that we have like an eight megabyte drive and how many directory blocks there are and stuff like that. Okay. We'll talk about this uh, next time as well. Here's their boot entry point. And remember, this is written in 8080 assembler and we're working with Z80. So these are all the mnemonics, the Intel version of the mnemonics. Uh, and uh, this is basically store the accumulator into memory at the address in the IO byte label, right? You know, you, you, I'll leave it as a test for the viewer to go grab a copy of, you know, uh, one of the uh, popular Z80 programming books that has a conversion table between, you know, the 8080 and the Z80, and you just look it up the mnemonics, okay? So what they're doing is they are uh, for, they, they put a zero in the accumulator, they zero out their IO byte and they store it in the current disk uh, byte in the zero page. Then they say, go down to the CPM routine. Okay. Now, what we did in our code is we, we initialized some hardware, we printed out a message, and then we are going to do this. Because I zeroed out the entire zero page, these bytes in the zero page will also be set to zero. Okay. Warm boot does a whole lot of stuff. We'll talk about some other time. And then it ends, it falls down into this Go CPM routine. And this is the source code that matches what we just saw. Okay. We need to store the three byte opcode and operand values for a jump instruction that'll end up going to the warm boot entry point in our BIOS. And we need to store that in memory at address zero. Then after that, we need to put a jump to the BDOS entry point, which is the uh, another one of these equates up here that was something or other blah, 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 06 up here, right? The CCP plus 806 thingy up here, right? And we need to put that in memory at a specific address, okay? Uh, here we go. And then what do we do? We have to set the default DMA address. This is not mentioned anywhere in the doc above. Uh, the fact that they do it in here, I strongly suggest that we do the same. <laughs> All right? Now, uh, they suggest this would be a good point to enable the interrupts if you need them. We're not using them right now, so we won't do that. Then what they do is they load the accumulator with the current disk value from low, from the zero page. I guess we could do that as well, but you got to be very careful. You need to make sure that you initialize it in the bootloader. If uh, the BDOS and the CCP changes the value in there for some reason, I guess what they want to do is make sure that you don't disrupt the, the disk number. Okay, now in a cold boot, it would always go back to zero and boot up and drive A. Uh, disk number zero is drive A, okay? And that is supposed to be in the C register, as the documentation says, before we go to startup CPM. Once you get here, you get your A prompt and you're off to the races. Okay, so let's look and see what I did over here. We already went over this. We zero out all that stuff. That's your, um, your, your, you know, your, 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 your IO byte and your current disk and stuff like that. And then we go to CPM just like they did. And let's go down here to my Go CPM. This matches theirs exactly, but I am using the labels that actually come from inside the source code of the CPM. Okay. Uh, warm boot is actually a label above in this exact file. It actually has to go here uh, to this entry point in the BDOS. So we're good there on our own. Uh, but this other one, F base, is a label that comes out of the source code that's buried in the uh, in this file right here. Okay. When we assemble it, I'll go open this thing up and I'll show you where that label came from, okay? If we look at the listing file that comes out of the assembly listing, we can also make real sure that the exact numeric value is correct <laughs> of where it's supposed to go, all right? So this is how you can just simply store in executable instructions. C3 is the opcode for a jump, and we're going to put that in address zero. Then we're going to take the address of warm boot, put it in an HL, and then store it in a memory at address one and two, because we're storing a 16-byte value, right? And it'll turn out that goes in little Indian order. And when we do the, the load to, store, to put it into memory here, it'll flip the bytes around and everybody will be happy, right? Same thing for the F base entry. Now, I added some debug code here 
that will dump out the contents of the zero page to make sure it worked correctly, okay? <laughs> then I just put zero into the C register and go off to C base. We could do what they did, and maybe I should, uh, using the argument uh, <laughs> that I used earlier. You know, if they do this, we might want to uh, do the same thing, all right? So let's go ahead and uh, what are we supposed to do? The current disk, it turns out there's another section of this manual where they describe all the parts in the zero page. I don't remember where it is. Let me scroll for a minute here. I think it's right up in here somewhere. There's like a table that says, here's all the stuff in the zero page. That has to do with the disk configuration. That'll be an entire uh, discussion in its own right. Here's the stuff for the zero page. Reserve uh, locations in page zero. I call it zero page, page zero, whatever. Uh, these bytes will contain a jump instruction. I got to put it there when I boot. This uh, is the I.O. byte that's optional I'm not going to use. This is the current drive number. So that's supposed to go in at address 4. It doesn't say how it gets there. It doesn't say who uses it, why it's used, or anything else. But they poked it in in their sample BIOS. So I'm going to poke it in in my sample BIOS. Uh, here's the other jump instruction that's supposed to end up somehow miraculously pointing into the BDOS. Then down here, what do you got? These are the standard uh, restart instruction addresses for the 8080 and the Z80. And, you know, so they don't use a bunch of these. They don't currently use this one, but they want to reserve it. This one's only used by the debugger, but, uh, you know, it's otherwise not used any other time. This is not used. This is a, um, a um, scratch area that we can use for anything we want in our C BIOS. These are not used in reserve. <laughs> this is some stuff these uh, that holds, uh, we'll talk about file control blocks later on. This is the BDOS tends to all this completely on its own. Consider this reserved, okay? Then uh, what is this thing? This is also reserved. This goes along with this. We'll talk about this later on. We'll talk about how to do file IO when we're running a program and stuff like that. And then from 80 to FF, as I showed in my memory map, this is the default buffer for uh, just doing uh, sector reads and writes if you need a scratch area, okay? So the, basically, nothing's used and or it's reserved in its entirety, except for a few items down here. We can zero this entire thing out, set these two jumps, and get on our merry way. But since they use this value in here, let's do the same thing and just load it from address four. So instead of loading zero into C, we're going to say load A. We can literally do this. Uh, I should have given it a label. Uh, load the current disk number from page 0 into A, C. All right, because now we can say put it in the C register. Because I don't think you can just load C with uh, directly from memory, all right? Uh, we have to get in, you can only put it in A or a register pair, maybe. Uh, then we can put it in C and then we can go out our merry way. So this now matches their example code. And at this point, this routine here is entirely finished. And in some ways, our boot routine is probably entirely finished unless we want to play around with things like interrupts and stuff like that, uh, which will come down the road. <laughs> Let's get everything working before we make it more complicated and optimize it, okay? So far, so good. What's really missing in here? Well, if we go back and read the documentation for what warm boot is supposed to do, say cut and paste it in here, what is it supposed to do uh, is, well, this is supposed to react to anything that happens when the, uh, boy, that's, there, there's a typo right there. <laughs> well, the location zero. If you ever branch the location zero, it's supposed to end up executing this code. That's where we have to put the jump instruction down there. That's the, um, the, um, this actually doesn't make sense to me. Uh, by the way, I think this is just, wrong or it may have been true in some days gone past uh, but i'm going to delete that comment it said or when it's reset from the front panel 
I think what they really mean there is if you go into the front panel, you can actually tell the CPU to execute at address zero. And the reason I think it's misleading is because if on the retro board, the closest thing to a front panel we have is the reset switch push button. If you push that button, that's completely different than what it means to go up to an 8080 front panel and tell the CPU to start executing at address zero right now. Keep in mind, remember, our reset button causes the flash to kick in instead of the RAM, and it does a completely different thing than simply saying uh, to the CPU, I'd like to, you to start executing at address zero right now, okay? So I'm going to delete that comment because I think it's misleading on uh, for the users of the retro board, okay? Uh, there used to be an aid in here, which is obviously a problem with the cut and paste or an uh, OCR problem when I copied this out of the manual. There's a lot of... Uh, problems with the optical character recognition on the alteration guide that I've already corrected most of in here, but there might be a few stragglers. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this thing has to deal with the kind of a reset that is not a full hardware reset, right? It is a soft reset. It is a warm boot, not a cold boot. Now, what that means is that the CCP and the BDOS have to be re-read in from our SD card. Now, we can't do that until we have the read and write routines done. <laughs> Otherwise, we got a little bit of a problem. Now, we could do it by calling directly into the SD card driver if we wanted to. Yes, we can do that. But uh, let's hold off until we get the general uh, disk I.O. routines working, okay? So I'm going to stub all that out right now. I'm not going to do it, all right? So if somebody actually tried to warm boot this in a situation where uh, we had, like, the TPA filled with a program, I said before, the TPA can actually overwrite the CCP, even the BDOS, if it wants to. In fact, it could even overwrite the BIOS. But if it wrote, overwrote the BIOS, there would not be, this code wouldn't be in the machine anymore. <laughs> the only way to recover from that is to do a full uh, hardware reset, okay? But if the uh, transient program clobbers the CCP and or the BDOS, which is free to do so, as long as it doesn't need to use the routines in there, it can do that. No big deal, right? But when it's done, this would have to be read back in, otherwise we can't resume the operating system and, and get the CCP going again, right? Remember, the CCP stands for Console Command process, uh, Prompt. That thing is the thing that gives you the A colon, and you type directory. That's your shell, okay? It's gone, and it'll crash if we don't get it back. Okay, so for now, we're not going uh, to run any programs that will cause these to be clobbered. All right. Therefore, I happen to know we can get away for a little while by not reloading these and just falling down into the Go CPM logic, which is exactly what this does right now. OK, so what it says, the warm boot and BDOS jump instructions and page zero must be initialized in Go CPM and control transferred at CCP, blah, 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 blah. Upon completion of this whole thing, it must go here to restart the system and set the drive uh, letter to resume using in this C register. So that's what's going on down there. All right. So we are compatible with now the the skeletal C BIOS minus what we're supposed to do if we actually can run any real programs, which we currently cannot yet do. So this is a relatively safe thing to do. Uh, what else is going on in here? Uh, all these little comment boxes came out of the alteration guide, and we can just rifle through these now, okay? Get the big picture of the drive. Let's just go through these other routines. What is this uh, BIOS console status routine supposed to do? On page 17, it says if the console device is ready right now for reading, I should add that. I'm going to edit their doc here. For reading, then return an FF in register A, otherwise return a zero in register A. Well, if we look at the um, SIO uh, driver logic, I added another label in there that goes along with, let's see here, uh, where is it? Library and then SIO.ASM. That's where our 
uh, root, our drivers and stuff. I remember the SIOTX ready and the RX ready routines. I stuck an extra label here on the receive ready uh, function that checks port A, which is our console port. Okay. And the reason I gave it an extra name, this is the cons the official console is port A on the SIO. And that goes along with down here, the official receive routine from the console is on SIO A, and the official transmit is also on SIO A. Now, the reason I did this is so that if we, if I felt like it, I can move these labels around without hacking up all my driver code. I can put the console, the official console receive, the official console transmit, and the official console status routines. We can move those around to other modules if we want to, and otherwise leave all this other code the same. All right, so that's why I did that. Those are just aliases that will come in handy. Oh, that's gone too far. So here we are. Now the console status. So what do I do? I call that routine. And while we were looking at it, I should have read the doc. Well, it turns out that. What this routine does is it returns the value zero in the A register, and the Z flag will be set if the port is not ready. So this is easy. I call inside here, and if the zero flag is set, I already know, because it, it's official, the, the API for my function I wrote, that I can say return if the Z flag is set, knowing full well that register A will have a zero in it, which matches what this is supposed to do. If a uh, if the zero flag is not set, when we get back from this subroutine here, then I need to put FF into the A register here, and then I return, okay? that This is done. <laughs> That's 100% done at this point. What does this one need to do? Well, remember when I adjusted the SIO driver and I said, I'm looking toward the future a little bit here? This is why. The console receive character and the console transmit character already do exactly what the BIOS specification requires. I don't even have to call it. I can just jump to it, let it finish doing what it's going to do, and return from there to whoever calls this thing. Okay. In fact, I don't even need this at all. If I wanted to, I could just put console transmit care in as the target address in the jump way up here. Okay. Right wherever it is, transmit right here. Instead of calling the console out, which is just a jump to another jump, right? I could just put all, you know, both of these, the in and the outs, right in here. Okay. Now I don't do that because I want to be able to have the, oops, I don't want to break my file. I don't do that because I want to have the option to put some debugging code in here in the future if I so desire. All right? So this is not as efficient as it otherwise could be, but hey, we're running at anywhere between 9600 baud and 115.2, which is agonizingly slow compared to wasting one instruction here while trying to print something. So I'm going to get over that. So as I said before, uh, what do we do if somebody wants a character uh, sent to the printer? I'm going to throw it away and go on my merry way. What are we supposed to do? Take the character that was given into register C when this thing is called and send it out to the printer. Okay, no big deal. Uh, what is the printer status routine supposed to do? Uh, well, it's only used by this program, so we don't have to worry about it right now anyway. But even if we wanted to do it, what are we supposed to do? The value zero is returned in the accumulator if the device is not ready to print something. Like it's offline or it's busy or whatever. Uh, otherwise, you return an FF in the accumulator if you can send something to the printer right now. Note that a zero value always suffices. This is right out of the alteration guide. So if zero always suffices, let's return a zero, especially since we don't have a printer. Therefore, it's really not ready. And even if it was, you know, all we would do is throw it away anyhow. All right. 
So for now, this will suffice. What if we want, what do we do with characters that go to our paper tape punch? We don't have them. Throw them away. You don't like that? Well, then don't put, send data to your punch. Uh, and then and then you don't have a problem with that, right? So what do you do with the reader? This is the thing that says, uh, you know, you're supposed to read the next byte from the paper tape device. If the device reaches the end of the paper, it'll return a hexadecimal 1A, which is the end of file. So we'll just always return an end of file. Okay, you just read a non-existent empty file. This will be fine, okay? Uh, what does this do? Okay, remember the home uh, function is supposed to move the head of the drive over to track zero. So I'm going to just print out a little routine that says, hey, the BIOS home routine has been entered. And then I'm going to put zero into the BC register pair, and we will see. It will then do what we need it to do if, 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 if we just need to move to track zero. Okay, so we're going to write a little debug thing here, and then we are going to just simply tell the set track routine to move the head to track zero. Now, we don't have a mechanical drive, so this is really not a big deal for us. However, we need to remember the track. This is the part where we have to save these things now uh, because we're going to use the track number later on to figure out which uh, SD card block we need to read or write. So we're going to store that in our save area. Then we're going to print out a little debug message, which is you will see in a minute, will include this track number. All right, so every one of these things that have to do with the disk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to print out a message that says, oh, uh, somebody just changed the track. And then I'm going to call this debug routine that's going to dump out the current track, the disk, and the sector, and the DMA, all that other junk. All right? This just dumps out all those variables. We'll see that in a minute. Okay? So what do we need to do for select disk? Exactly the same thing. Store the, the disk number into our local variable. Print out, hey, somebody just messed around with the disk number. And go on our merry way. Now, this routine is actually a little bit, or can be, uh, fairly complex, but um, we are going to just simply stub it in and return, no matter what they ask us to do, we're going to say the disk that you have asked for is not valid. Okay, uh, again, paste it out of the alteration guide, page 18. It says the uh, register C will have the disk number in it. Zero is drive A, one is drive B, and so on. Okay, up to your 15 uh, 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 for the last drive. Total of 16 disks, right? So that's why we have the 16 8 meg uh, blocks or, or disk images in one big partition that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so this is where we're working towards. Let's get one to work before we worry about 16. And then it says, uh, each time you do a disk select, you must return in the HL register the base address of a thing called the disk parameter header. Now, that's the stuff that we saw in the C BIOS over here that I said we'll talk about some other time. So they have it right after their jump table. These are the disk parameter headers, all these variables inside here. And what these describe are like, as you can see, uh, some of the values in here uh, will describe I don't know, what's the maximum number of things that can fit in a directory and something track numbers and sector per track. And or this has to do with defining the geometry of what a disk looks like. All right. We'll go over this some other time. But right now, uh, since we don't have this, we haven't talked about it yet. What I'm going to do is no matter what drive CPM wants to use, we're going to just say we don't have that. And the way that works, we simply return, uh, put a zero in the HL register when we go back. And we'll see in a minute, it'll say, oh no, I can't select disk A. And it'll complain, but who cares? That's what it's supposed to do. It will start working in that it will print error messages. So this is how we're going to stub in the first version there, okay? What do we do if we set a sector? We're going to save it, print out, hey, somebody messed with the sector, go on our merry way so we can use it later. What do we do for the DMA address? We save it, print it out, <laughs> go on our merry way and use it later, okay? So each one of these things up here, you can see, uh, every case it says, I, I am this function, followed immediately by 
dump out uh, the, the, the debugging data for the disk. Well, here's the debug disk routine sitting right here. And what this is gonna do, look closely at how this works. This message up here says, I've been entered colon space, and there's the end of the string. I don't have a carriage return in there, okay? So at this point, it'll continue printing whatever this down here prints out. So what we'll see is like BIOS set DMA entered colon, and then you'll see uh, in each of these cases, it'll say, hi, I've been entered, and then it'll say this. Disk number is currently set to this, which is where we stored the disk number and we're gonna print it out in hex. Then it'll say the track is currently set to whatever. Then we'll say the sector number is whatever, and the DMA address is whatever, and then we got a carriage return, okay? So that's what's going on with the, hi, I've been entered, and here are all the settings that will be used if someone subsequently calls the read or the write function later on. So what happens in the read and the write function? Well, page 19 says, assuming that all of the above routines have been called for the drive and the track and the sector and the DMA, blah, 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 the read routine will use that data that you've already received to read a single sector based on that stuff, okay? When it's done, it'll return a value in register A, which will be zero if everything went well, and one if something bad happened. like. We stubbed it in and we don't even have a disk drive right now. If this ever happens, it'll print BDOS error on drive whatever, bad sector, and so on. At which point, the operator of the machine can either hit carriage return to ignore that error and go on, which is usually a bad idea, or you can type control C to abort the operation. It didn't say in the manual, but this will cause the warm boot entry of the operating system to be entered at that time, and it'll try to reset itself, okay? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna say, hey, somebody wants to read. I'm gonna debug, dump out all the disk routines. I'm gonna return an error and go on my merry way. What happens if we write the exact same thing? Hi, I'm trying to write this stuff here, and I had an error, okay? This is where we're at right now. Uh, what happens with sector translation? Okay, now I said before that's optional. Let's look at their code for a minute. And you want to see this because two things happen. One, this is something that a lot of people complain. Oh, there's a bug. And da, da, da. No, there isn't a bug. The problem is they didn't read the doc. All right. This sectran routine goes along with this sample custom BIOS that's based on standard 8-inch floppy drives. If you don't have 8-inch floppy drives, then you need to read the doc and do the right thing. Now, they could have been nice and checked for the case where the uh, translation is disabled, which is the case we're using right now. Right, so a lot of people in modern days doing their retro project, Google it. You'll see no shortage of blog entries saying everything works great except for it got to sectran and the whole thing died. Okay, don't use this code as is. Okay, what you need to do is ask first: Do I need to translate the sectors? Because as I've been saying repeatedly, we don't translate them when we're using the SD card. Right? If you don't need to translate them, don't do this. <laughs> if you do need to translate them, then you can use this. All right. So, what's missing here is an if then else kind of expression in here that says, do I need to do this or not? All right. So, my sectran, because we don't support anything at all other than the retro board right now, we're going to do the alternate version which is not do any translation at all. And if you read the doc, it says the sector number is given in the BC register, you know, when this is called. And then there's a table that's given in the DE register that you use to do the translation. And when you're done, you're supposed to put HL register equal to do the, the, uh, the, the, the translated sector. All right. Now, I didn't go into the details of why you need to translate and what is the physical, what's the logical, blah, 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 blah. This is optional. It has to do with uh, an optimization that is really important and useful and valuable if you're using slow floppy disks 
and you're trying to read the sectors in order while the disc is physically spinning around and around and around. As if you read sector one followed by sector two, and your uh, your CPU takes a little while when sector one is done before it's ready to start reading sector two, and it misses it even by one single bit, and has to wait for the disk to go all the way around before it comes back again to do the reading. All right, so uh, back in those days, what we used to do is we didn't read them one, two, three, four, five in that order. We would read like one, three, five. Or even worse, we'd skip many sectors, okay? The idea being if you read a sector, you don't read the one right after it. You read this one, and then when you come back to read whatever the next one is, you skip one. And then you skip another one like this, or two, or three, okay? So that's what this is supposed to do, is come up with what's the skip factor, what we call the interleave, and then tell me you know, which sector I should read, even though I want to read like the first logical sector, which actual one should that be, and so on, right? None of this is relevant or of any value whatsoever, as far as I know. Let me know in the comments below. If we're using an SD card. So what I'm going to do is set HL equal to BC for what I call one-to-one -one translation. There's no uh, what we call skew factor. In fact, go ahead and look at all the retro boards out there that use CF cards, SD cards, even hard drives, IDE drive. No one translates those. Why? Because it doesn't matter when you have a fast disk. It only matters when you have a slow one. This will cover our, our needs probably forever on the retro board. You will not want to use this if you decide to get creative and you want to hook up an actual floppy disk on the expansion connector on the retro board. Then you might have to ask, you know, is this drive uh, a floppy disk or an SD card? And then react accordingly. Okay. This is what you want to do if you're not using actual floppy disks. And now we're back down to the end of the file here. There's the initialization routine for the console. We see it a million times. I'm running at 9600 baud for that realistic feel, okay? Uh, we've already seen this. We know all about this. And here are the variables for the initial values of the, uh, the things we need to save. And I sent them all to some garbage value so I can really obviously see if they're garbage or they have been set when the debug routines run. So let's compile this up. And let's put it into partition one on our SD card. Throw in a sync for good measure. Put the SD card back into our retro board, hit the reset button. And see what happens. All right, this is where we left off last time, right? So we dumped out, you know, the, okay, so this is the flash loader right here, right? It says, hi, I'm booting up and blah, blah, blah. And I've, I haven't updated this in a month. Um, this is from our Hello World example. I already talked about it. There's really no reason to change it. And uh, when it reads in the uh, first 32 blocks, it prints a dot for each block so we can kind of watch it progress. And then the actual hard, the, the, you know, the, the boot entry, the cold boot entry runs and it prints out this uh, stuff from the retro.asm source code. Then it initializes the low core and go CPM and all that other fun stuff. And then I call the hex dump routine, right? And there we got it. Here's the two jump instructions that are poked in there after I zero out all the uh, zero page. So far, so good. Now, this better be a jump to EA, uh, what is that, EA03. And this is a, uh, C3 is a jump to DC06. So we're going to verify that in a minute. I'm pretty sure it's good because we got this far and uh, uh, we're, we're doing okay. So what happened down here? Uh, once I dump this out, remember, I loaded the drive with the value that uh, the the example code used, which is at address four, right? Oh, one, two, three, four, which got a zero out of there because I zeroed it out, right? It's griping that there's a problem on drive A, which is great because it whatever it's doing, it better be using drive A because that's what we told it to use. And uh, once we branched into the CCP, after printing this out, what happens? Well, 
it hits our debug routine. It says set DMA has been entered. The current disk value is garbage. The current track is garbage. The current sector is garbage. It makes perfect sense because if it did uh, ever called the routine to set these, it would have print out <laughs> that the disk was set, the track was set, and so on, right? So what did it do? It called set DMA and it set the DMA address to 80. Actually, you know what that is? That's my own call in the uh, in the Go CPM routine. I should probably print an extra message out to make sure of that, but that is and go CPM. That must come out from. Oops, here we go. Where's the go CPM? Too much doc. <laughs> Somebody delete all the doc. It's getting me confused. Uh, where is it? Uh, well, you know what that is? I don't know where that's coming from. This probably is coming from the CCP. I did not put that in my code yet. Now, it just so happens that it did get called. I mean, obviously, it printed out, hey, somebody called me. But I forgot to put this code in my, in my Go CPM routine. That's probably not a good thing. Now, you might argue it's perfectly fine, because clearly the CCP did it, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. This is some overwhelming circumstantial evidence that the CCP and or the BDOS does, in fact, call DMA, set DMA. And I don't really have to do this in my Go CPM routine. But like I said, you know, if it's in here, I'm going to keep it. I suspect, to be honest with you, that this was probably required in like CPM 1.4, but it's not required anymore in 2.2 and this is you know some vestigial code that never really got cleaned up and in my head i remember i had to do this and the first time i did a cpm port was with 1.4 and you know it's been a long time so it's a little jumbled in my head but i'm gonna go out on a limb and say i'm still gonna go ahead and put the the set dma routine in my go cpm logic because their example has it in there I mean, never underestimate anyone's ability, especially mine or yourself. You know, with all due respect, no one writes doc that's any good. Okay? It just never happens. Uh, make sure that you don't make any mistakes. All right? I'm going to be very conservative here. <laughs> and do the... Uh, make a gratuitous call just in case. So I'm going to go over here and say... Uh, this is here because it is in the example C BIOS on the AG's alteration guide, page number 52. Okay, for future reference. Okay, uh, now that's fine. All this is really going to do is it's going to end up giving us an extra call to set DMA and set it to 80 twice. That's okay. But uh, as I scratch my head right now, I mean, where did this come from, right? Well, apparently not my code. So let's make sure that uh, we, we do it even if it's gratuitous, okay? So uh, when we run it again, it'll probably print this out twice. And then it'll move on to select disk. And uh, clearly it tried to select disk number zero, which is a good sign. No one has set any track or sector yet, and the DMA is still there. And it's going to gripe because it selected a disk that we told CPM does not exist. Okay? So this is as far as we can get until we finish the disk parameter headers and the disk parameter block and get all that stuff figured out and understand the geometry of what a sector and a track and all this other fun stuff is because an SD card, uh, the blocks on an SD card are a different size than the sectors are in CPM. And because I'm working with CPM 2.2, we don't have any option other than to be, be forced to transfer blocks into and out of our disk or sd card in, in 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 sector sizes of 128 bytes each so now we need to move on to mapping each of these 512 byte blocks in, in in into the way that cpm sees these uh 128 byte sectors so spoiler alert that'll be the next thing we figure out here all right i think we've run out of time for today uh so this is a great stopping point 
Uh, there is one other test I guess we can do, right? Remember, it says BDOS error on A. What, what, what are our options, right? Well, it turns out we can either front button the machine, which we just did, and it'll go back and do this again, or we can press a key to ignore it, or we can hit Control C to do a warm boot. Now, it turns out uh, the uh, CCP and the BDOS have absolutely no option whatsoever than to do a warm boot or to just seize up whenever this happens, okay? Now, I'm going to do a control C, and we'll see what happens is, once I did that, it goes back to warm boot. Warm boot does its dump and goes back to CCP. CCP, now remember, we were already uh, uh, running and no one, we didn't do a hard boot. We did a soft boot, a, a warm boot. So it turns out that the disk number and all this stuff, these are still set in in these values when it comes along and says, okay, set DMA was called. And we're still running the old code. If I had my new code re, re, reassembled and, and in, installed here, it would probably print out set DMA twice. Okay. Then it's going to go back to do the select disk for drive A, and it's going to crap out. And it'll just do this again and again and again. This is as far as we can go. It has no disks, so it, it really has its hands tied. So, what we do have right now is a fully functioning console, and every one of these routines, in addition to being nicely documented, <laughs> is stubbed in, really ready to go. So all we need to do is finish this logic here that has to do with letting it know that it does have disks and that it can function and all that fun stuff. And uh, then we can focus on debugging our reading and writing routines because everything else is kind of kind of ready to go. I mean, think about this. All you really got is a console, the printer, and the disks. The printer should be easy. We already did that one. These routines, like I said, they just store variables and move on. We'll just remove all the debugging noise eventually once we verify everything's cool. And then we're focusing on reading and writing the disk. And then we can come to live with CPM. We can run all the regular programs and everything else. <laughs> It'll be pretty cool. All right. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.